The title for today was Making the Most of Our Humanity. So let's start with what is humanity at core? What are the core human values that we want to grow into? And then as a follow-up, if you feel so inclined, can we say anything intelligible about which future development is desirable or are we prone to a value drift that makes predictions about what future versions of ourselves um, we ought to have pretty meaningless? Huh, humanity. What, what is humanity? Um, well, I think it's more than, more than our DNA, our, our flesh and bones and skin. Um, I think our, our, what's really humanity is the stories and the stories we tell each other, uh, you know, and the basic emotions we feel, I think, things like love, um, fear, uh, you know, desire, longing. That, that's, that's humanity to me. Those are the things that haven't changed for two million years uh, and have been passed down to us in the form of story over and over again. And I think th that... That is what everyone aspires to, right? Like, again, as we solve all the things we're talking about, right? So, so what? Then what? You've solved all these things. You could live forever. Who cares? Um, and I think it's so humanity can experience more and then share more. Uh, and I think that becomes the end, the, the end goal, right? The change that, that really matters um, as a whole. I wonder if what it means to be human actually has stayed the same in the last two million years. I feel, so one of the things I do on the side is I'm a genealogist. I love researching genealogy stuff. And when I look back at records 150, 200 years ago, it's so heartbreaking to see, you know, a, a couple would have X number of kids. Half of them would die as infants. Then the wife would die in childbirth. The guy remarries the next woman. She dies in childbirth. Just the, the kind of heartbreak and what, how we think about love for our children and so on. I, I wonder if that is, has been something that changes and then will continue to such that in 100 years, our great grandkids will sit around and say, well, you know, we tried reading the, the, the stuff that they wrote in 2018, the novels and so on, but it just doesn't really apply to us anymore. Uh, in the same way that often we read, you know, Greek mythology or um, medieval literature, and, and as much, I was a, an English major as an undergraduate, and as much as I appreciate that, it does feel a little bit removed from the modern San Francisco things that we care and think about now. So anyway, it may be that uh, what humanity is is a moving target, and every year it's, it'll be a different answer. I think like one way of phrasing this might be maybe we have the same archetypical values, but they just get expressed differently over like evolution of humanity. Or one might be are they actually um, really like evolving? I, I mean, in terms of moral progress, for example. You know, like, we definitely look back also not only a hundred years ago and pity them, but also are horrified by the things that were okay then morally, right? And I always think it's interesting to, uh, to me, like, morality is the negotiation between which biases we want to call values and which we want to call biases. <laughs> um, and it's um, ever-evolving, hopefully, right? Um, and I think it's always interesting to predict more progress. Um, and there's a couple of values up there, actually, that uh, are transhumanist values and extropian values. Uh, that are currently always being updated just as a kind of refresher in terms of like what's really out there if you think about it. Um, and those are also always currently like um, continuously updated. I think like something maybe where we can really make that fixed is if you imagine kind of the end of the roadmap, right? And we've reached kind of utopia in both biotech and neurotech. How does this biotopia or neurotopia look like? And, for example, does it allow, like, if, if, imagine, just imagine that biotech allows kind of, like, physical upgrades that are immune to the danger and wreck of disease, and neurotech allows for reconfigurations of neural tissue to avoid suffering, for example, or any other way that you might want to go about this. Is this a life worth living? Um, or do we need to feel ups and downs? A life without pain isn't a life. You know, I, I think, and, and that's, uh, it's just a, it's just one of the senses, right? It's, it's not, and it drives us in certain ways, and, uh, and, and pleasure is the same, uh, you know, it drives us in, in, in other ways. Um, I think suffering is a different story, right? Like, I, I was inspired by Viktor Frankl's book, as many millions of people have been, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, and being able to distinguish or turn pain into meaning. Um, and, and distinguishing truly the difference between suffering and, and pain. 
Uh, and as an athlete, I think about that as well. <laughs> as, I'm, as I'm undergoing pain, I try to remember that I don't have to suffer. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, I think we need all those things. Again, I think story or, or how, we, how we relate to our own lives and how we relate to each other is, again, through these common experiences. And those common experiences, I don't think, by definition, by definition can only be rosy. Um, and I've known a lot of very, very, you know, people that had most of their, I was a bass jumper for, for many years, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, a lot of people were death apathetic that had all the disposable income they needed to, to ch solve any problem they had, um, and yet they were still death apathetic. So, you know, that, I think, uh, I think, yeah, we, we, life experience has to have its full range, always. It is the case that that range of emotion steers us. It is our learning signals to tell us, oh, don't do that. That doesn't really work socially, but you should do this. That's working and so on. So they are learning signals for us. Um, but I do think that the character uh, of these signals changes through time. Um, you know, I mentioned, uh, you know, with genealogy or whatever, but uh, also with, with pain of any sort. I mean, it was the case a few hundred years ago. You scratch yourself, you might get your arm sawed off at the doctor's office. And, you know, it was incredible pain, pre-anesthesia, stuff like this. So um, I think there are ways to... Um, that sort of pain has been mitigated, and at least to our knowledge, we're no less uh, human. And so it may be that that's also a, a moving um, picture that we're trying to look at there. It's interesting. Um, we also have addiction, right? And so, uh, and now, right? I, I mean, I guess they had addiction. Yeah, they, they had addiction to different drugs <laughs> back then. But, but yeah, I mean, I think it is an interesting question as to uh, what does it mean to remain human as we solve for many of these problems, you know, inevitably. Yeah, I think, um, like, I've, I've recently been digging a little bit into, like, different utopian theories, and one that would kind of doubt that pain um, must be a part of it is, like, uh, well, there's one, the hedonist imperative, and then uh, there's one fun theory by Leszek Rukowski. Uh, if people want to explore worlds where suffering or, um, or, or pain in general doesn't have to be uh, a part of, th those would be ones... Um, but, you know, you, you kind of then get into the question of, like, okay, wh what then? You know, how to diversify uh, emo emotions then? Uh, can, can, I, can I just say one more thing about that, which is um, uh, uh, my friend Peter Bauman, who probably some of you know, he has this, uh, this thing that he says, which is that some days are better than others, by which he just means that, uh, y you know, the way the brain is built, it's an adaptive system. So no matter what's going on, you're going to adapt to that as your new baseline. And then you'll have ups and downs around, around the new baseline. And that's just, um, unless we completely reconfigure the brain so we're not the same at all anymore, that's so fundamentally how the machinery works. So, so if you win the lottery, you'll be really happy for a short time, and then that's your new baseline, being a billionaire. Some days are better than others. If you, if you get handicapped and you're in a wheelchair for the rest of your life, that sucks for a little bit, and then that's just the new norm. Could you reconfigure it such that instead of ups and downs, there's left and rights, so just diff different types of emotions, and that's still interesting enough to be a utopian model? I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> there would be something to be experienced. Just left and right. All right, okay. Um, so we've been talking for most of the roadmap really about kind of shaping the current product of evolution, which is our body and our brain, right? But there are some arguments that we might also have to rein in the default curse of the mechanism of evolution. Um, and there's a particular argument that says that we're currently in an evolutionary disequilibrium. We're not fulfilling our evolutionary purpose to propagate our genetic material really well. We're not using sperm banks <laughs> and donating all of our eggs, but perhaps not for long. Perhaps biotechnology, uh, biotechnologically we could engineer ourselves uh, such that we can easily have more offspring, which is sexually ripe sooner. Or neurotechnologically, we could upload and copy, so we might soon enter a race to the bottom to becoming the dominant gene or upload copy pool. So this is kind of like race to the bottom evolutionary argument. Do you think um, this is a likely scenario? Are you worried about this Malthusian catastrophe in the very long run of kind of a forced return to subsistence level conditions once this kind of population growth um, outpaced production? Uh, from a, 
from a biotechnology perspective, uh, no. Um, I think uh, I'm optimistic that as population increases, we'll be able to use biotechnology to address planetary health issues that can support that population. Um, and, and that's, you know, things like being able to provide clean water, uh, clean food, um, high quality protein to a growing planet. Now, you know, some of the technology you're talking about, like uh, in vitro gametogenesis, right? To being able to, to create um, eggs and sperm from skin cells, let's just say, uh, and make massive copies of ourselves. Uh, you know, that, that's a real technology. That's not science fiction at all. Uh, the artificial womb is making progress. It's, uh, a, a, a baby calf, I think, was uh, held um, it, for, for months now, uh, you know, uh, early stage. So, you know, the idea of fertility is an actual real pressing issue. Um, uh, there's more, more people are actually going to the clinic at a younger age, fertility clinic, than ever. It's something we've been thinking about at Indie Bio a little bit more lately. Oh. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, there's an interesting experiment that was done called uh, Universe 25, if, if some of you guys may have heard of it. It was an experiment done in the 70s or 80s around a mouse population in utopian ideal conditions. And the mouse population exploded, as you would think, hit a Malthusian curve, and uh, actually um, fertility dropped in, uh, completely in the population, and the population crashed. Um, problem solving and creativity actually increased in the mice. Along, alongside that. So it, it, there's some things that are paralleling some of that. Um, but the technologies will exist. Now, which way will humanity take it? Do we, what do we use that for? And, you know, there's shades of the brave new world conversation happening up here, right? Uh, oh, you know, a pain-free environment, um, you know, uh, classes of people, or let's just say, that, that, can, that can do labor or things like that. Um, hopefully that's not where we go. From, from my point of view. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, it seems to me that having children is so easy to do that even as we come up with new technologies that we could do things with sperm and eggs, it, it, it may be that it's tough competition against the good old-fashioned way of making children, and we're not... We're not entering a population explosion. It's the opposite. Uh, the, the world population is leveling out because of things like economics and education. So if I understood your question correctly, it seems like even if we said, look, you don't have to waste a single sperm or egg. You could have lots of kids. People wouldn't be terribly incentivized to do that anyway. Um, and obviously, as education goes up, the number of children goes down uh, in families and so on. Um, as far as the race to the bottom of the gene pool in terms of people cloning themselves, um, uh, what you lose there is the hybrid vigor, which is to say when you mate with someone in the old-fashioned way, you get a child that has, you know, hopefully the best of both uh, sets of genes. Um, so, uh, hope, I mean, y you know, there, there, there have been all these fictional stories like, you know, okay, here's a hundred of Hitler's babies or something, but then what you have is a hundred screaming, pooping infants and it's not, uh, you know, and then, of course, the way they grow up in the world will be completely different. They'll rebel against their father. They'll do whatever. And so it's not clear to me yet, at least, that, uh, that cloning a lot of oneself would be that useful just because you end up with a bunch of infants that you have to take care of and they'll all, you know, rebel and get on YouTube and play Fortnite all the time. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, the Alice Huxley view of the world uh, is a frightening one where you would have a thousand clones of yourself, but they'd be attenuated in a way that would be uh, optimized for a certain task or something like that. So we think about robotics as being mechanical objects with these, you know, uh, machine learning brains. Well, it doesn't have to be. It can be a biological system, you know, that, that does a task very well and attenuated in a way that optimizes for it. And that's you know, it, my reading of, of Brave New World. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's, that's, we have lots of those, right? Like horses, for example. Other beasts of burden yeah. are, are right. biological yeah. examples of that. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. um, hammering in on uh, whole brain emulations again. This one would be not pooping babies, but it would be pretty easy to copy yourself, right? Like, I mean, you said against clones, okay, you clone yourself, but then you still have the pooping babies around. But with brain emulations, copies would be pretty easy to make. I was wondering whether you think that's 
like pretty far futurist that's no worry at all um, or for the technical reasons that I mentioned earlier, it's pretty far away in the future. I'm not sure, and of course, you know, our, our imagination in 2018 is so limited, but I'm not positive what the advantage would be for me to spend $2 million to make a brain emulation of myself. I mean, uh, there's the immortality thing, but, but if we're talking about being present at the same time, uh, I'm sort of... What, oh, productivity. Oh, that's good, actually. I could set him to write the next book. That's a good idea. Um, <laughs> Yeah, all right, well, okay, I'm sold. Yeah. yeah, you can't say, oh, I can't clone myself anymore. <laughs> okay, great, you're sold on the evolutionary race to the bottom, great. <laughs> no, uh, but, okay, so getting a little bit more down to earth, right, so let's maybe talk some specifics here. What do you think are, like, the main ethical conundrums that you see arising in biotech and neurotech in the near future? Economical or ethical? Um, ethical conundrums? Like, what are the main ethical problems on the kind of like a little like, closer to home horizon? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the biggest one from a humanity perspective is the ability to design ourselves. Once we have gene delivery uh, figured out, it won't just be germline changes to, to your children, which is, in my mind, ethically very difficult to do because that person does not have a choice in the decision you're making for them. Um, and I think that's, in today's ethical framework, already difficult to, to justify. Now, justifying genetic modification to yourself, uh, once you understand delivery and you understand the, the, the gene-gene interactions that control these macro phenotypes that we talk about, like intelligence and uh, you know, strength and you know, the, the typical attributes we, we like, uh, to have more of, let's just say, or, or have less of in other cases, that I think is a much harder ethical question. Um, and especially when you start thinking about the ability to manipulate that again in germline and you start to say, okay, well, the gulf between, let's say, rich and poor becomes insurmountable within a generation or two if those techniques are available to uh, buy price, right? And so uh, these are all extremely difficult um, questions to grapple with, especially when you start talking about other nation states. Not, the United States is not a, in a vacuum, and you could think of um, an authoritarian regime that would step in and say, okay, well, we're going to create a, a, a race of super people uh, to populate our country uh, and move the country forward. And, and again, you know, this is, after all, a bunch of technical issues are solved, but you know, that, become, that becomes the ethical debate at hand, and you start to invoke things like national security and you know, uh, human security. Uh, in the long run, as I talked about earlier, uh, genetic diversity being the savior of humanity through shocks, external shocks. Um, so I think that's the biggest looming debate that has to happen and conversation. Again, I don't think this is anything that any one person will be like, ah, I've got the answer. <laughs> you know, like, Here, let me write it down for you. Um, I think it's a conversation that happens um, over time and, and something we arrive together at as a society. Um, some of the ethical dilemmas with neuroscience, um, obviously Westworld is, is painting a picture of, of one of those. And this is, you know, Arvind and I were talking earlier about... Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I, yes, I'd, I'd get shot if I did. But the, Arvind and I were talking about earlier about... Um, these delivery robots, and Arvind was saying some people here in San Francisco kick them over because, you know, because you can and maybe they think, fuck the machine and so on. And so what we were talking about was I suggested, well, what if you really built these robots so that they were sentient, they had a sense of pain, and everybody knew that. And then it would be the question of would you kick a dog or would you kick a horse or something? You probably wouldn't do that if you knew that the thing would feel pain. Anyway, this is one of the ethical things that's getting a lot of play. When I think about the ethical issues of neuroscience, though, at the far end of the spectrum, there's stuff that I can hardly even speak about because it's so, uh, it's so awful and terrifying to think about, which is as we get better and better at understanding what's going on with brains and brain plasticity and so on, if you think about the weaponizing that will eventually take place where maybe just I'm making this up, but where you have something that induces brain plasticity so that all the soldiers, poof, their brain becomes plastic again, which means all the stuff that's been stored in there over years of experience just kind of goes away and they become like infants again. That would be, 
equivalent to death, but worse in, in certain ways, because who you are is really nothing but your brain structure that, t- that tells you all of your memories and where you've been and how you think about things. And if all that got erased, which is just a matter of getting the neurons to, uh, to be plastic again instead of cemented into place, then, um, then you've done something really awful there. And I sort of uh, shudder to think at, at a future where, where people will develop weapons like that. Yeah, I mean, great. You're leading into my new questions on the weaponization of this. I was thinking, and not just only the plasticity, but also something like mind crimes, right? Inflicting uh, an insane um, pain um, neurologically, right? That, that, that could potentially be easily done, correct? Um, and also on the biotech side, of course, uh, the weapons and weaponization is, uh, is a big factor too. So I was wondering whether what you see on the horizon there and whether you think there's anything we can do preventatively now, right, um, while this is not here yet, to, uh, to try to get a hold of it uh, before it overrolls. Yeah, the um, you know, weaponization of biology is, is easier than, um, than you'd think. Uh, and, and, you know, scary, right? Uh, it was kind of interesting when I very first started uh, IndieBio, before we had an office or anything like that, I went out to iGEM uh, competition in Boston, and um, I was a judge there, and, and this guy taps me on the shoulder, and I turn around, and he's like, oh, you're Arvind Gupta, and I said, yeah, and he goes, Hi, I'm with the FBI, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, and he goes, I'm the head of counterterrorism for US, and I was like, all right, uh, and he's like, you know, we want to talk to you because we were behind on the IT uh, side of things. Uh, and we're catching up, and we've, we're catching up fast, but we really don't want to be behind on the biology uh, side of, of terrorism. And uh, so it was, it was a, yeah, I was very impressed, actually, with, you know, the questions he's asking, and, like, you know, in the end, he's like, hey, if you, you know, so if you see anyone, you know, messing with any stuff, you know, please let us know. <laughs> I was like, yeah. will do. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, in terms of the actual weaponization of biology, it, it's a, you know, It's a weapon of mass destruction, but it is also a potential weapon of mutual destruction. And I think that's one thing that keeps it from being, at least in my heart, <laughs> um, something that people would employ right away. Because you could try to design in kill switches, you could try to design in things like that, but as Jurassic Park has taught us, nature finds a way, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and so, um, and so that, that's one, just one of those things that, that you have to be Uh, cognizant of, and, and hopefully that's just an area that people just don't want to touch, because again, a weapon is only useful if it doesn't really, you know, kill you as well. But, yeah, I, I mean, but the only difference, I think, being that um, weapons of mass destruction uh, were really expensive to produce. I think the Manhattan Project was like two billion or something, right? And those kind of like synth- in synthetic biology it would be much cheaper, and even a small lab with a small number of people could could potentially do it, uh, and they might not even have that wish um, for deterrence, or they, they might not even care enough to, 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 stay, to stay alive for longer. So it would be really hard to monitor. Um. Yeah, that, no, that's a really good point. I mean, th- and there are people like that. Uh, and, and, and yeah, so the cost is much, much less. I think there's another issue, which is when you really think long-term, 100 years, uh, nation, you know, 200 years, 500 years, uh, nations come and go. And, uh, and so when you have stockpiles of anthrax and things like that, uh, where does that control go? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're talking about unearthing, uh, you know, Siberia's thawing out and diseases are being uncovered, you know, are unthawing. <laughs> so uh, the, these are, they might be gone for right now as we weaponize them, but I think, you know, they need to be destroyed and there needs to be an absolute moratorium and ban on it and extreme vigilance um, on on controlling things that, that could potentially lead to that. In the same way we control uh, you know, Schedule One drug uh, ingredients, uh, it's not so easy to get those things. So, you know, I think that's where some of the, some of the precautions can be taken. My intuition is that uh, biotech's going to be a greater threat than neurotech, just in the sense that if you wanted to torture somebody by simulating pain, you'd have to actually do an open head surgery and drill a burr hole and lower an electrode into just the right area. And then sit. But that's no economic competition to the good old-fashioned torture that you can do to somebody 
for free with a hot poker or something. So that's why I can't imagine that it would go in that direction. Sure. Yeah, I was thinking more in, in the kind of like far future in terms of uploads and kind of like perpetual suffering. But uh, again, that, that might be a little too far. <laughs> okay, uh, cool. So, um, well, so those are, the, those are definitely risks. And do you see anything, you know, I mean, this is, it's, it's all really fun to talk about those risks, right? And, and it's almost like this kind of morbid fantasy that turns on when, when talking about this, I think, um, at least for me. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but we're here um, because we want to see a good future, right? So what are things that people in this room could do, um, really, um, to get involved if they wanted to, um, to help steer a positive path for neurotech and biotech? What are, what are ways we could actually, uh, what are good action items after this? I, I think it's, it's clear it's the conversation that needs to happen. Um, and that, com that conversation starts as policy. Uh, and forming policy, and uh, it's it, biotech started. It was the birth of biotech was Genentech because of policy, because universities could not do genetically modified organisms, and so a private company did that to create insulin. I mean that that's a really a remarkable outcome of policy, um, and so when we start thinking about that, um, especially with the advancements happening between CRISPR and uh, and, and all the things that we can do, and the cost being lower and the speed being greater, uh, really that conversation needs to happen. And so, you know, it, this is a very highly engaged uh, room full of people that I think uh, immediately could, could ignite and, and spark that, that conversation and, and sweep it to Washington uh, with the right leadership and, uh, and get it to a place where uh, the conversation becomes national. And, uh, and there's, you know, uh, media that can that can help make that happen, um, but but it needs to be as much an uh, important thing for the for global health as well as national health. And so I think that's where we'll see it. Right? We talk about Russians hacking the election through Facebook and social media. Um, we're not talking about um, you know how we can how, how genetic engineering is going to change the way. Uh, we live in the in the near future. It'll show up as a scare article once in a while, but that's not policy, right? Like that's not that's not shaping an, a, a very um, uh, rigorous conversation or debate around the issues that arrive at a place where we can move forward uh, without moving backwards. So I totally agree about the conversation. The only thing I would add to that is just that. Um, Shaping policy is a big is a big part of what is a big part of what I'm working on. So, Allison, I know you know I, I direct the Center for Science and Law, which is this non nonprofit about the intersection of neuroscience and the legal system. And part of the issue there is that brains are just really different from one another. There's as much variety in people's faces in a room as there are in their brains. Um, so what we have in our legal system, our criminal justice system, is we treat all brains as though they are equal, which is very charitable, uh, but it's demonstrably incorrect. Along any axis that you measure, you find that brains are really different. And so what this gives us is the opportunity to build meaningful rehabilitative strategies, to do tailored sentencing, um, and even to think about how to structure policy uh, at the population level to, to better achieve what we need. But, but what it means is instead of a judge pretending that all these people in front of the bench who've done the same crime should get exactly the same thing, exactly the same five years in prison or something, instead being able to recognize, okay, well, look, that person's got schizophrenia. It's not going to help that person to break rocks in the sun all summer. Uh, this guy's a psychopath. We go on a different route. This person's tweaked out on drugs. Go a different route here. It's not about letting people off the hook it's about saying, look, here's, here are things we can do to optimize what we're doing to help society. So anyway, I just think there's a lot to be done there right at the level of, uh, of the intersection of what we're doing and the way we make laws right now. Yeah, I, um, one of my favorite papers was Moral Luck by Thomas Nagel, where he talks about um, kind of like four different ways of not moral luck and how they should be distinguished in the legal system, especially as, as we become more aware of our neuronal structures. Instead of asking another question about free will or such, um, uh, we, let's um, 
make it open for questions from the audience. Um, would, Lou, would you just like to shout them out? It's detrimental, and uh, I think, in this, you know, one way to think about this is detrimental, and uh, I think, in this, you know, one way to think about this maybe is um, we have, we all when we get in a car we have to wear a seatbelt, right? Um, why should I wear a seatbelt? It's my car, it's my life, you know. I I don't see why that law should be applied to me. Uh, well, it's because if I get an accident, I'm using society's resources to patch myself up, and th that's an actual drain on the people around me, right? Even though I might be thinking I'm just hurting myself. Um, and I think the same line of reasoning goes with biohacking, where you're injecting yourself with some CRISPR or some whatever n nucleotide you think is going to help you in some way. Um, I, I just... I... I, th I I believe in regulation and regulatory. Um, I'm a VC that believes in that, believe it or not. Um, I think it, there's a reason for it, and I, I believe in that reason. I think we need to produce uh, treatments and cures that are safe. Uh, and it's easy, you know, if you've had a loved one that's been sick before, you, you wouldn't want, I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine injecting or administering something that you don't know what the effect would be. A horrible death worse than whatever cure your, uh, you know, treatment or disease they had uh, could easily be there, right? So, like, you know, when, when you start thinking, but, oh, okay, well, it's biohacking yourself, you know, why should that apply? You know, it, it, in my mind, um, it just goes back to that idea of, look, you know, you're going to get patched up. And so it's not something that, that society should bear necessarily uh, from my perspective. Oh, sorry. I, uh, I think that even if you put legislation in place, the enforcement's very difficult. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, I have a little bit of inner libertarian that shudders at the thought also of, of the government legislating what you can and can't do with your own body. So, yeah, these, these are the issues we'll have to wrestle with. No, I totally agree with that. It's a hard, you know, it's a hard one. Um, and, uh, you know, again, right, like we're wearing a seatbelt or... Um, abortion, you know, it's a, all of those things are, are, are society issues that, and, and legislation, uh, and I don't agree with a lot of it, right? And so, you know, I think there are things that you should be absolutely free to choose, um, you know, uh, like children. But uh, injecting yourself, you know, it's just, we're so early in that stage, and we also don't understand, like, is there a deleterious effect that the person hasn't noticed that could get passed on. Uh, you know, like th these are things that we don't quite understand. 99.9% um, of the time, I'm sure nothing will happen, right? But, um, but there is that off chance. So anyway, I think until we understand, and then it could, like an adverse outcome, then affects all the really rigorous work that happens. So uh, erring on the side of safety there, I think, is prudent. It would help if the current existing system was a little better. <laughs> Um, in developing healthcare. Okay, uh, Lou, next question. I mean, like one thing that was is here on the court in Zimunis values is the morphological freedom, right? And I think I think it is it is a really important one to get right, right? Like this um, this notion of what can I do with myself, right? Do you think if there do you think if there was no if there was no effect on society, there's anything that you shouldn't be allowed doing with your body? If there was no effect, do you think there's ever anything any benefit to society that um, kind of like should make you do something to your body? Like let's say if we knew for AI safety, okay, um, uploading a certain person or individual or like increasing their cognitive abilities. Um, would lead to AI safety. A hypothetical example, right? Um, is there is there anything we can make individuals do for the collective good, good them? Yeah, I mean, look, the counterpoint to my argument is Louis Pasteur, right? Uh, obviously. And, and so, 
you know, he was testing a hypothesis on himself and then demonstrated to the world, uh, you know, the, trans the mechanism of disease transfer. That's, that's an incredible moment in human history and partially led to the population explosion we see today. Um, and, you know, to deny the next Pasteur that chance is really, you know, that's, that's a big responsibility for someone to take, right? And, and so it is, you know, it is a, a tricky question. Now, the, the question of having that, you know, leak outside of that one person is the, to me, is the question at hand because, again, if I know that it's just going to affect me and no one else and it's siloed off, sure, right? Like, everyone has a complete right to their own body, I believe. Um, and so the question of transmission is really, to me, that's, it's a good way of defining it. Uh, that's the defining factor to me. I have nothing to add. Okay. All right. Many of you probably know Steven Pinker's uh, b book and argument, yeah, um, uh, which he outlined in The Better Angels of Our Nature, and then he's got an updated book called Enlightenment Now, but essentially his argument is that violence with any measure that we make is, is going down. I mean, we sitting here don't have to worry about bearded horsemen riding in and slaying us all tonight, and so... Uh, it's just, you know, the, all of society has just gotten better and better over the last several hundred years. But one of the things he points to is the invention of the printing press in 1493. And, and violence has sort of been going down since that point. And so his, his uh, point there is that something about the in, increasing empathy that people have where you get to read books and you get to step inside someone else's shoes and understand what it's like to see the world from different points of view. And as literature spread, it, it, it made us better humans in that way. So one of the things that people think about, and you know, we're a long way off from this, but you know, the idea of, of sharing a brain with somebody or actually knowing what it's like to be you, not just because you've written a story about what it was like, but actually get to be Arvin for five minutes and Allison for five minutes, that might even increasingly enhance our empathy. Yeah, I mean, for me that's an amazing answer because as a designer, um, you're taught to have empathy in order to create great products, right? And so this would be the ultimate in extreme empathy for understanding and relating to other people and cultures. Right now, the best way to do that is to travel the world. Uh, and then you become, in my experience and uh, with other people, a better person. Um, but it's a really well way to put it. Yeah, another one? Open source, Neurotech and Biotech, yes or no? It's, uh, it's the same double-edged sword that we faced with so many things, which is just that it will en enhance somebody's ability to do something bad with it, and it will also enhance all kinds of uh, innovations with it. So we'll, we'll get the good... I mean, it would be the same sort of question about should you open source uh, how to make a nuclear bomb... Um, there's all kinds of great energy uh, leaps that we'd get out of that, but it's also dangerous, perhaps. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, no, human knowledge is, is advanced, in essence, through open source, uh, through publications and things like that. Um, and so the, the, it's not going to change. Uh, I think commercializing technology is... Not generally not open source, especially in the world of biotechnology, um, where you need to to spend a lot of money, and so you have to protect that uh, for some amount of time. But uh, but I do think you know again in open source, the, or I should say the net net is positive, as we've seen through history. I think we've gotten more um, positive gains out of it than negative. All right. Um, yeah, I think uh, in terms of open source. Um, we wrote a paper on decentralized approaches to mitigating existential risk in which we argue for a fairly open source approach in the sense that open sourcing kind of kills uh, fragile or like uh, vulnerable systems pretty pretty early and pretty visibly. 
uh, in many different instances, so that, that might be one that is more pro-open source. However, at the uh, previous AI strategy meeting that we did last week, um, there was a lot of uh, worry about open, open source in, term, in, in terms of AI and sharing inf information in, in AI. Um, so I think that question of how much to open source will be one that we're going to be tackling a lot in the future. Um, and not that we haven't done that in the past, really, but I think it's, it's a really important one. So that was cool that that was on the table. And there's new technologies like the blockchain that might make that better, right? Oh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about the blockchain for biotech and newer tech here. While we're at it, we have to sprinkle that one in. Yeah. I, I, can't, I, I can't really. I mean, we, don't, we, don't, we haven't seen that many applications, actually, um, of blockchain. Um, but, but, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of hope that uh, it could decentralize knowledge in certain ways, uh, and that this is one area in which uh, potentially you could open source something with, but while maintaining some sort of uh, accountability. Anything on new tech? Not on the horizon yet. No minds on the blockchain yet. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. I really enjoyed this. I think for in terms of our topic today, right? Let's see if I can. Like really on the where the focus was really on strengthening civilization, right, um, and then making the most of huma our humanity being a part of it. Could you maybe leave us with kind of like a hopeful comment? Why are you in this field? What are you, what do you see? How can biotech and neurotech really not be only beneficial to the individual, but really be good to strengthen civilization, to be tackling the risks and hopefully moving towards positive futures? Yeah, I, I think. Um that's why I do it, right? It's because biotechnology can transcend a person and uh, be extended to the entire civilization. Uh, and so that's where we talk about planetary health uh, versus human health and why we are funding companies uh, that, are, that are looking at larger problems in that way. And so, yeah, I mean, that's in essence the reason I'm here is to create that change for our, our future generations like my children and their children and all of our children's uh, futures. We're not going to feel the effects of climate change in our generation uh, to the extent that um, our children's and, and their children will. Like that will, the, there's a NASA simulation of global climate change. Uh, in the next 80 years, it's, it's shocking. Um, how much uh, temperatures are going to rise. Uh, and this is like the most advanced you know, climate modeling that's been done. Google it and, uh, and prepare to be amazed. And so that's something that, that is an extremely real thing that we all will stack rank pretty low on our daily sort of like, what are the things you're worried about? Well, everyone's worried about climate change. It just happens to be at the bottom of things that you worry about on a daily basis. Um, and so it's, it becomes a tragedy of commons. And I think, uh, you know, one of the reasons I'm doing this and what, what we do at IndieBio is to not just solve for human health care, but for the planetary health care and save the, world, save the planet that we actually have as opposed to talking about going to other planets, for, you know, because we've trashed this one. I would say that if we merely cured brain diseases and, and mental illness, it would be an enormous benefit to humankind because there's so much suffering that happens with that. And then I think, you know, generally the, there's no end to the possibilities on the horizon when it comes to this issue of expanding senses, not, you know, not having to wait for Mother Nature's time scales to give us new senses and, and new cognitive capacities, but to actually build that ourselves. I mean, n none among us know where that's going, but uh, there, I think the possibility is very exciting there. Well, um, thank you both so much. Uh, that was quite sobering, interesting. Um, and I think also Stephen Pinker phrase, um, it leads to conditional optimism, right? Like we're here because we want to get it right, um, and, but it will only go right if we make it right, right? Um, so I think um, with that being said, thank you so, so much for making time for this. I really, really appreciate it. I hope you guys did as well. Thanks a lot. I had a really good time.